So as, uh, as I just uh, told Jean, I've been here for four years, uh, always based in Shanghai, always working as a consultant. Uh, most of the time uh, working for Design Share and Associates. Uh, I lead the French desk uh, here at DSA, so I supervise all our French accounts. Um, I'm also in charge of our French marketing strategy, uh, and I can say a little bit more about that uh, down the road. But I also work with the different technical teams uh, to manage projects and usually uh, act as a sole point of contact on projects and advise uh, clients on, on their strategy, on how to enter China, how to uh, start a business here, uh, and how to grow their business. Um, so who are we? Uh, in a couple of words, uh, we're a Pan-Asia uh, FDI advisory practice, a foreign direct investment advisory practice, uh, with offices across the China region, uh, where we were set up uh, 26 years ago now, right here in Shenzhen in South China. Uh, but for the last 15, 20 years, we focused our expansion outside of China uh, into the wider Asia Pacific region. So we now are able to advise our clients uh, in all of these countries, India, uh, China, of course, uh, Southeast Asia, Hong Kong. Um, and we really try to advise them not only on how to enter the market, uh, understand the market, uh, what type of legal entity they're going to use to structure their investment into these markets, uh, but also once the business is set up uh, to stay as the main advisor uh, for all of these clients and help them with ongoing HR, accounting, tax uh, support services so that we can help them grow their business uh, in Asia. So that's a little bit uh, who we are. Um, so my colleagues are uh, basically attorneys, uh, lawyers. Um, they're CPA accountants, auditors, HR consultants, uh, tax specialists. Uh, and really, we try to be a one-stop shop. Uh, we help our clients, as I said, understand the market, uh, understand the regulatory environment, understand what type of business they're going <coughs> to set up here, as well as really on an ongoing basis, uh, most of our clients outsource all of the uh, business support services to us so that they don't need to worry about the tax, they don't need to worry about the HR, and they can focus on their business. Um, so now we, we sort of uh, gave you a brief introduction about uh, the Chinese economy, uh, the, the Chinese economic system uh, in the China market. Um, now a lot of uh, foreign investors uh, that want a, sh a share of this market, they'll be thinking about how do I structure my investment into this market? Uh, do I need to set up a company here? Uh, and how do, I need to, how do I set up a company? Well, the answer uh, usually lies in this list. Um, China has a negative list uh, or a catalog to guide foreign investment. Uh, it's really to educate foreign investors about how open or how close Chinese industries are uh, to foreign direct investment. Um, and if your industry falls in this catalog, um, such as you know, commercial, thing, commercial fishing, um, of course, everything related to press, uh, radio, TV, uh, weapons, things like that, everything of strategic invest in interest to the government is completely close to FDI. So you cannot invest in any form in this market uh, and you're really uh, barred, barred from investing into this market. Um, if your industry falls in the restricted uh, list and there's 35 industries currently in the list, a notorious one of course is manufacturing of automobile vehicles. Uh, to invest in this industry, uh, you need to set up shop alongside a Chinese investor. And that means you'll need to set up a sino foreign joint venture with a Chinese company. For example, uh, Renault and Peugeot are in a JV with Dongfang. Um, but all the securities companies, insurance, all of the financial uh, services industries, sorry, uh, a lot of uh, education companies as well uh, have invested in China in the form of a joint venture. And we'll talk a little bit more about the joint venture as this presentation progresses. But the good news uh, for uh, foreign investors is that by far, uh, the, by far the highest number of industries are considered as encouraged. 348 industries uh, are considered as encouraged. And for these industries, uh, foreign investors are allowed to invest on their own with full control and full ownership of their business. So no need to set up a, a joint venture. And, uh, and indeed, the list is quite large. Um, so depending on the industry that you're, you're in and depending on your business model and your plans for China, uh, you're probably going to structure your investment choosing one of these three structures. Uh, the first is the Sino, Sino foreign joint venture. Um, as I said, it's the structure of choice uh, for people doing business in restricted uh, industries. Uh, and you usually, you usually have foreign investors that invest uh, from overseas and a Chinese investors that invest from a Chinese company here in China. And they invest jointly into one structure. A new structure is created, a joint venture. And they use this uh, to, to operate their business. 
Uh, usually foreign ownership has to be at least 25% or 30% depending on the industries. And this is because the Chinese government wants a commitment into the joint venture from the foreign party. They don't want uh, a foreign investor just putting 2% or 5% into a joint venture and using this to uh, gain access to restricted industries. Uh, the rep office is a simple extension of the foreign company in China. So not a legal entity of its own, no legal identity of its own. The, le the legal identity is tied to the parent company overseas. So it's just really a branch of the parent company overseas, and I'll describe that a little bit later. Finally, by far the most popular structure is the wholly foreign-owned enterprise, the WUFI. Uh, and this is the type of business that allows foreign investors uh, to set up shop in China, um, mm -hmm. to conduct business in China with full ownership, full control over their business. Uh, and this is why uh, it's by far the most uh, popular structure in the Chinese FDI space. Now let's uh, look at these structures in a little bit more detail here. The joint venture, um, why do foreign investors choose joint ventures? As I said, it allows you to invest in restricted industry, which is great. Uh, if you're manufacturing uh, automobile vehicles like Renault, uh, you have no choice. But joint ventures are great because you can utilize all of the assets of the Chinese party. And this can be hard assets such as machinery, warehouse, uh, the logistics system. All of this, you know, you don't have to invest that, start that from new. You can utilize all of the assets of your partner. And this is great. Uh, it allows a lot of cost sharing and risk sharing with this partner who's investing uh, alongside you. A lot of soft assets as well uh, will be brought in by the, the Chinese partner. Uh, their knowledge of the market, their knowledge how to manage the workforce, how to manage government relations. Um, there's tremendous knowledge that the Chinese party has and you can access that knowledge by starting a business alongside the partner. But why do we see that um, joint ventures are a little bit unpopular in the Chinese FDI space? Of course you have to share the profit and, and you lose control, so even if the JV works very well, a lot of the money will go to the Chinese party. Uh, it's all a little bit slower to, to control the company because a lot of the decisions will need to be made jointly with the Chinese partner. But this is true for any business, uh, any JV around the world. But we do see that uh, co-managing a Chinese JV, a JV with a Chinese investor, is particularly difficult in China. There can be dif different expectations coming into the business, different ways of managing the business, managing the workforce, managing the accounting. Um, so really, there's a lot of differences between how uh, foreign investors uh, would prefer to manage a business and how Chinese investors typically like to manage a business. Um, and this often leads to trust issues or uh, operational issues with the JV. Uh, unfortunately, the Chinese party usually has the upper hand because they know the local market, uh, they know the, the judicial system, perhaps they have connection with the local government, uh, they have connections uh, with the local staff, of course. So no matter whether you're a majority or minority shareholder in the JV, uh, probably the Chinese party will have a lot of power uh, and influence over the JV. Uh, protecting IP is a little bit difficult. You can have all the NDAs you want. Uh, you can lic license or protect your trademark in China. Uh, at the end of the day, there will be IP or know-how flowing uh, from your company to the Chinese party. You can't manage a business with a partner without sharing information, without sharing uh, your, your business idea. So there will be IP flowing uh, and this can be an issue uh, if down the road the parties split up and do business uh, uh, separately and they become competitors. Of course, all of the resources, all of the IP that you gave the other party can be disadvantages to you. Uh, and finally, the biggest, I think, issue with the JV, and we see this time and time, of again, time, and time again, is that if there's an issue with the JV, uh, it's very difficult uh, to keep the JV operational. Um, it's very difficult to close down the JV because for a lot of the key decision making, uh, you need to do it jointly with the other parties. You need the signature of the other party. Uh, you need their approval. And that's true even for uh, closing down the company uh, or for exiting out, selling your assets, selling your equity in the business. You need the other party's approval. So if the two parties stop talking to each other or enter into a situation of conflict, you have this deadlock issue. And not only is the, the JV useless um, from the operational perspective, but you can't even close it down from the legal perspective. And I'm currently uh, working with a French business school, actually. Uh, they're structured as a JV in China here in Shanghai, and they're by far the majority shareholder of the JV. But because of the corporate governance, how they designed the corporate governance, they gave all of the control to the minority shareholder because he's the person on the ground. So they thought, you know, he needs to have the keys to the business, right? Otherwise, my business will be too slow if I have to approve things from France. 
So they gave all of the power, the decision making to this minority shareholder. And now they're in a, a, a situation of conflict and even the majority shareholder owns more than 70% of the business. They cannot close the business. They cannot sell their, their, their shares of the business. They the business is totally stuck. Um, so we're trying to help them, advise them about uh, the next step and how they're gonna liquidate the business or sell their equity to this uh, minority shareholder. Uh, the rep office, as I said, is a very simple structure, the most simple structure uh, that a legal, that a foreign investors can set up in, in China. It's just an extension of the foreign business in China. Um, and it's great because uh, it's very quick to set up, two to three months. Um, it might not seem like a, a short amount of time, but in, in the Chinese legal uh, company uh, legal environment, uh, it's actually a very short two to three months. Uh, it's uh, really cost efficient to set up. Uh, you don't need to commit registered capital to the business. Um, so it's really a little bit of a risk-free or, or limited risk type of, of option. Um, but the business scope of a rep office is very, very limited. Very, very limited. It's only appropriate to conducting marketing uh, activities or market research or liaison. Um, so it's just to allow you to have a small team in China um, to do some market research, to talk to suppliers, talk to distributors, but you cannot sign contracts, you cannot collect revenue locally or make profit. So all of the sort of uh, official business, official trading uh, needs to be done through your headquarter back in France. Um, so it's really limited and a lot of uh, customers or suppliers, they won't like to work with you in this fashion uh, because it's difficult to move money in and out of China. So of course, uh, if you have uh, suppliers uh, in China, uh, then you need to pay them cross-border. It might be difficult for you to do that and for them to get the money uh, cleared uh, at the bank. Uh, conversely, if you have customers in China, it might be difficult uh, for them to pay you uh, cross-border and they might not be willing to do that, to pay you in France. Uh, also, a lot of your customers will ask you to provide a special tax, a Chinese tax invoice called the FAPIAO. You'll probably hear a lot about that. Uh, and of course, your French company cannot issue this type of invoice. So a lot of customers will say, if you don't have your formal uh, limited liability company here, uh, we won't do business with you. Uh, and this is where you need uh, this structure here, which is the wholly foreign owned enterprise. And there's three types of woofies. There's a service woofie. Um, and just like a rep office, uh, you can conduct uh, market research. You can have your team here. Uh, you can do a lot of consulting related services and marketing related services. But the big difference is that you can sell these services. So, Consulting companies such as Dozen Share and Associates, we are structured as a consulting woofie. So we can sell our services, uh, we can collect revenue locally, we can issue special VAT invoices to our customers locally. Um, so it's really a, a fully, uh, fully owned, fully operational service company. Uh, if you wanna trade products in China, so if you wanna import products into China, uh, sell your products in China, or uh, conversely, source products in China and export your products back to France, you'll need a trading woofie to do that. Uh, and this is really the woofie that allows you um, to, to purchase products, sell products, and conduct international trade. Finally, if you want a uh, manufacturing plant in China, you'll need a manufacturing woofie, which is uh, the most complicated uh, type of woofie to set up. Uh, it has the same uh, business scope as a service and a trading woofie, but on top of that, it can actually manufacture uh, products on Chinese soil. Uh, and that's the manufacturing woofie. Now the big advantage of the wholly foreign owned enterprise, of course, compared to a JV, you have full ownership and control over your business. So that's a big advantage. Um, no need to share the profit, uh, no need to uh, share the decision making. You can do all of that by your, on your own. Um, compared to an RO, you have a much broader business scope and you can actually collect revenue in China and, and do business directly with Chinese customers. So that's a big advantage. Uh, issue invoices, as I said, uh, higher staff as well, because as an RO, because you're not a legal, uh, you're not a legal entity, you can't sign labor contracts. So you need to work with a dispatch agency, uh, such as Dozenshira or, or Fesco, uh, to sign labor contract with these employees and to dispatch this workforce to your RO. So you don't work with your staff directly from the legal standpoint. Of a, a woofie, of course, uh, is allowed to sign labor contracts directly with the employees, whether it's a foreigner or a Chinese. Uh, so it allows you to uh, independently uh, manage your workforce, which is a big advantage. Limitations, uh, compared to an RO, it's more costly and time consuming to set up. Uh, you'll need to inject registered capital, so actually commit a minimum amount of investment into your business. But there's a lot of flexibility now about how much money you want uh, to commit to the business, but you will still need to make a commitment. 
Uh, compared to the JV, of course, uh, you're still barred uh, from accessing some restricted industries. I mentioned uh, manufacturing uh, automobile vehicles, for example. Um, so that's one, but there's a certain amount of industries that you're barred from uh, doing business in. Uh, once you set up your business, you'll have this piece of paper, and if you go to a restaurant, you'll see they have to put it on the wall. Uh, and this really shows to everyone uh, all of the key information, the key components of your business. Uh, so the company name, and you'll need to choose a Chinese name um, for your company. The, the Chinese name is legally binding in China, so you can have an English name, but you'll need a Chinese name for your company. Who is the shareholder? Uh, so are you going to invest directly from your French uh, company in Paris or are you going to set up an uh, intermediary holding company in Hong Kong or Singapore? That's a big question. Uh, luckily, French has one of the best DTAs in the European Union with China. A DTA means double tax agreement. Um, so actually, there's a lot of tax advantages uh, for French investors doing business in China uh, because the tax, withholding tax, uh, when they repatriate their profits from the Chinese company, the Chinese subsidiary, back to the headquarter, the shareholder uh, in France, uh, the tax rate uh, is very low, potentially as low as 5%. Um, so 5% is the best type of rate that you will get, for example, in Hong Kong and Singapore. So now we see that French companies, they prefer to invest directly uh, into their business and they won't set up an intermediary holding company to become the shareholder of the Woofie. Uh, of course, if you don't have this intermediary holding company, it's a little bit leaner, a little bit more cost efficient, a little bit more quicker uh, to get the money in, get the money out. Uh, and also, it's very difficult now uh, to set up companies in Hong Kong. Even in Singapore, it's getting more difficult. So there's a lot of issues with bank accounts. Uh, Hong Kong banks now don't really like to uh, open bank accounts for foreign companies because of all the compliance um, requirements related to uh, FATCA um, and the common reporting standards, the CRS. Uh, which gives a lot of authority to foreign uh, jurisdictions uh, such as the IRS in the US to take a look at the bank accounts in Hong Kong. Uh, and, and for that reason, the compliance requirements are very high and the Hong Kong banks will say, sorry, we don't want to open a bank account for your business. Um, registered address, you'll need to choose an actual physical address somewhere in Shanghai to register your business at. That's still a, a requirement. In Hong Kong, you, know, you can use a virtual address or a PO box. Uh, in China, unfortunately, you need an actual office with an actual desk and a door um, to register your company at. So it does increase a little bit the cost, um, and that's something to, to keep in mind. Uh, the legal representative is uh, the most important uh, person that you will choose in your corporate government structure. <coughs> it's really the person with full authority over your business. The legal rep has a chop of his own, uh, like, a, like a signature. Um, and really they have full authority of the business, they can empty the bank account, they can sign contracts, terminate contracts, close the business, um, make key changes to the business structure. So whoever you, open, you choose as your legal rep must be someone you fully trust, um, really someone that uh, you can rely on um, to protect the interests of the shareholders in China. The good news is it doesn't need to be a Chinese person or it doesn't need to be someone in China. So usually a lot of clients, they will choose someone who's based uh, in the headquarters in France and that's totally fine. Uh, I talked a little bit reg about registered capital. Uh, if you have a, a WUFI, a limited liability company, you'll need to commit a certain amount of funds into your company uh, and that's registered capital. You can inject it throughout the life of the company but you still need to commit to a certain <coughs> amount at the start of the business. Uh, finally, I want to say a few words about the business scope. In some jurisdictions like the US or overseas, uh, you can have a very broad, very wide uh, business scope. In China, they will ask you to be very specific and list the type of business activities that you will conduct in China and secure um, uh, approval on these business activities. And you'll have to write them very specifically to your, um, on your business license in the business scope. Um, so this includes uh, what type of products you're going to trade, how you're going to trade. So for example, this business um, can trade a packaged food, but you see, it, it includes refrigerated and frozen food. But this means it doesn't include, for example, fresh food, all right? Uh, also, they're allowed to do wholesale, import and export, commission agent. That means they can't do retail, for example. So it's not only what you sell, but how you're going to sell it. And this you need to secure approval. And depending on your business scope, you'll need additional license and permits. For example, if you're trading wine, uh, you'll need a business license, but you also need a food operation license, which uh, all F&B business, uh, whether you're a retail or a wholesale business, uh, need to obtain in China. You'll also need a liquor distribution license to give you the right to trade alcohol. 
So depending on your business, you're likely going to have to secure additional approval, additional licenses, and that's something to keep in mind.